Hi, I'm Gwen the Potter. Uh, order the laurel. Uh, I get, got my laurel in, if you can say that I got my laurel in anything, it was in pottery. Been doing pottery now for since 1981, I think it is. So a long time. I did have a, a long time that, um, like 10 years that I couldn't do much of it because I was a military wife and moved around. And even though we moved by wheel around, we didn't necessarily have the ability to too much pottery. Been really concentrating on it since I basically joined the SCA 23 years ago. Um, the SCA gave me um, a focus on what to do in pottery. So uh, being able to be interested in a time period helped me get focused on what I wanted to do and improve my work. So tonight we're going to do um, a pipkin. A pipkin is a three-legged small cooking pot, usually made out of clay, most of the time made out of clay, that you can use over a brazier, not necessarily with flame, but with uh, coals or charcoal. Um, it, the the three legs keeps it up off the ground and out, it, out of the fire so much. And, um, but you can also use it as a portable little um, heating device. If you have a tray with coals in it, you can take it to a table if you are very careful and you can, you can uh, have it on a table. Um, the, the pipkin that I'm going to show you today is one that I did several years ago. Let's see, I'm not even quite sure. March of 2011, more than several years ago, uh, when I entered the um, Kingdom Arts and Sciences Championship, and I actually won with this as one of my entries. So this, I hope you can see it, is the pipkin that I'm looking at. It is a uh, pipkin that was produced in Utrecht in the Netherlands around 1400. It's a small pipkin with three legs, a handle, and a spout, and with some uh, circular decoration on it. That, this is the actual extant piece. Do it closer to see if you can see it. See? But, no, nothing looks exactly the same. My piece, which I have over here out of my reach, that I created for the competition is this one right here, out of a dark red clay. And it's a nice little pipkin. It's a good, good hefty pipkin. It's not gonna break easily. In fact, a cute story, when I finished this, doing my pipkins, I had like four or five of these done for my competition. And in order to show what the fabric of the clay looked like on the inside, I needed a broken piece, so I threw one of them on the ground. It took three tries to break it. So. Clay can be sturdy. I wouldn't recommend throwing it on the ground, but this is a pretty sturdy little pot. So we're gonna work on that. Um, I'm gonna move, well, I'm not gonna move, I'm gonna be, stay right here. This is what I'm using as a wedging table. And I first thing I need to do is wedge up some clay. It's really cold out here right now. It's a little chilly outside, which is why I'm not doing this outside on my period, period-esque pottery wheel. I'm gonna do it inside on my kick wheel that's in here. I'll be adjusting the camera because it's my cell phone as I go along. Here's a block of clay. This clay I get from Seattle Pottery. It's one of the last blocks of clay that I have because I actually have a pug mill and I, re -pro I, I process my leavings and I have like three 55 gallon barrels of clay that needs to be reprocessed. So I'm using up what I have and I'm going to um, I'm going to um, create more clay to use over the next few weeks. I think I have only one more block like this left. So I'm going to use a wire tool. A wire tool is a wire with a, uh, a two little sticks on either end used to cut the clay because pulling clay off this block is almost impossible. Cutting the clay with the wire tool is much easier. And I've got to figure out what size I want to use. It's 
couple things I need to be aware of. I'm going to be making legs, so I have to save some clay that I so I can use to make legs and the uh, spout, not legs and the handle, not the spout. So I got three chunks of clay here, and the first thing I'm going to do is wedge the clay. And this is just the clay cut off the block. I can't just throw this on the wheel and and do it. Although this clay has been de-aired, de this would be a hard chunk to throw on the wheel. So I do what's called wedging to create a cone of clay. The reason it's called wedging is because the end product kind of looks like a wedge when it's actually a cone. So in order to do this, I'm not kneading the clay. Kneading tends to put air in it. I am pushing the clay in a way to push air out and to line up the platelets. So I'm really only pushing on one side. This hand is just holding it steady and creating the cone. So, see, I have a cone of clay. See the bottom creates a, a spiral thing on the uh, uh, Worm. The way that I put on the wheel head is down like this, so I can't have all these folds and spirals. It will create air bubbles. So the next thing I do is I'm going to close up those folds. I'm using just pounding a little bit around, slowly going up because it's tiring pounding it with your hand like that. Just trying to close up all of the spirals. Now it's a smooth bottom. I'll round it up a little bit, smooth the sides. Now I have a nice little cone of clay that I can use to throw with. Let me throw, let me wedge a couple more. These are small pieces to wedge. The bigger they are, the harder they are. The, the less wet the clay is, the harder it is to really moist clay is the best to work with. Um, as long as you don't get too moist. You gotta you gotta find that right consistency. This is a really nice consistency for throwing small things. My problem is if I wanted to get a whole lot bigger I would have to have a moisture clay or I would do something like throw down one piece of clay center it and then throw another piece on top and center it on top to, to create, increase the size because I don't have a whole lot of upper body strength that I can uh, use to uh, really muscle the clay where it needs to where it needs to be. Clay is, consists of a bunch of platelets you know it's dirt earth that's been under pressure and Inside the clay, there's platelets. They're all over the place, right? The, the act of wedging lines them up more so that it makes them easier to throw. And it just, it just the form flows better. Okay, this is a bigger piece. I have to get some height behind it to get it moving. I usually have a bench that I stand on so I can get on top of this stuff. But it's over on the other side of the room and I'm not going to go get it. All right. This will give me three pieces to work with. You see me looking at the camera a lot because I found that it's kind of nice to see what I'm doing from a distance from a different angle. Uh, when normally I, all I can see is what I'm looking down at camera has really been able to give me a different focus. Okay, so now I have three balls of clay. I'm going to move them over to the kick wheel. I'll be right back. Using the kick wheel instead of my electric wheel to give you a better medieval experience. Working a kick wheel is completely different than a motor, motorized wheel because you have to work harder at it. 
So this is a modern kick wheel. Let me give it there. Uh, we've got what, a, what is called the wheel head has a couple of pegs in it. So I don't throw directly on the wheel head because the pegs would kill me. But I have her bats, these circular, circular bats with holes drilled in them. And I just set the bats on the pins on the wheel head. Now I've got to pull up my dress because I don't want to wrap it around the axle because I have done that before and it's not pleasant. All right. So first of all, I got to clean my wheel head because my, clean my bat because my bat has got leavings from the last time I used it. Well, excuse me a moment. I got to get my splash guard. Because I don't want to get too much play on my dress. So I have a splash, splash guard for this. Slow it down and put my splash guard on. Oh, or maybe, maybe I'll put my splash guard down. There we go. I haven't put it on in a long time because I usually use this wheel for trimming. And I don't need it because I have what is called a Giffen grip, which is a you know that's not going to go on. I'll just have to deal with it. It's too hard to put on. A Giffen grip, which is the thing I use to trim, it centers the clay. This is the Giffen grip. So that I don't have to use uh, pieces of uh, clay and center it manually or anything like that. All right, Let's sit on my dress. All right, so let me get this wheel head clean. Just wet it down. Take a wooden knife. Just a wooden knife. It's a piece of wood that's. Uh, Cut it at an angle. I'm gonna wet it because it's got some dry clay on it. All right, got that cleared off. Now I'm gonna get a, a rag and kind of dry it off. All right, so I'm bring my pipkin over here so I can look at it. All right. So I'm making a shape that's bulbous and then it's collared in and, and flares out. I'll keep this where I can see it. First thing I'm going to do is put, I'm going to use a, a medium size piece of clay. This bat is still a little damp and it needs to be so that the clay can adhere to it. So I'm just going to smack it down right in the center, as close to the center as I can get. And then I smack it down some more so it doesn't slide on me. Now that's when they're good. Then I need to get the wheel going really fast. This is a heavier wheel than on my demo wheel outside. The heavier the wheel, the more centrifugal force you have. This one is basically metal. So I'm, I'm centering now and pushing the clay toward the center. And because this is a kick wheel, I'm gonna to have to kick it every now and then to keep it going. So it takes a little bit longer for me to center this because I'm using the kick wheel. And I'm not using the motor assist on the kick wheel. There's a little motor on this that'll keep it going. I'm almost centered with the clay that's been de-aired. It, it doesn't take as much time to center it. Okay. That's pretty good. All right, so I'm going to first open up a cylinder 
but the bottom is going to be rounded because this pipkin has a rounded bottom on the inside. I keep my sponge wet because you don't want to touch the clay and have it dry or not slick because then you'll, you'll, your hand will catch. So I'm using my thumb and these two fingers. Two fingers are on the sponge, squeezing moisture in as I go. Push down in the center till I feel like I'm close to the bottom. I don't want to go all the way through, but I want to make sure I leave enough room. That, so it doesn't go all the way through. Okay. So I've opened it up in the bottom. I'm going to take the water out. I don't want to have water staying in there. Making sure I'm not too, too terribly close to the bottom. That looks pretty good. Now I'm going to open it up a little bit more, making sure I curve up and create a curve on the bottom of the pipkin. I'm also going to start pulling. This hand goes on this side, this hand goes on the inside, and then I squeeze and pull up. Now I triangulate. My arms are in my side, my, my thumb and my two thumbs are actually touching, centering that power onto my hands. And then I'm not pulling up like this, I'm actually pulling up together. So Yeah. So that's the first pull. I'm actually going to move the camera because you're not going to be able to see me pulling because I pull on the right hand side. So I'm going to move the camera over here to see if I can do it like that. All right. All right. There we go. You might be able to see it better this way. This is why I like the phone camera. All right. So let's do another pull. Remove some of that moisture. My my slip bucket is really, really thick. I'll add some water to it to thin it out. Make it more loose. Easier to absorb that water. Okay, so here we go again. Another another pull. And I'm actually pulling out and up because I'm creating that bottom bulbous bottom. You see how the wheel slows down? So I can't go any faster up than the wheel is going around. So I have to adjust how fast I'm going up. All right, that's pretty good. I'm going to kind of form bottom, rounded and compressing it. That looks pretty good. What's that? Part of my sponge broke off. These sponges are pretty old. All right. So let's go up a little bit higher and out more. Make that pot like bulbous bottom. I'm not going to make it too terribly thin. Because I want it to be able to survive a fire, so I need to, it needs to have a little bit of heft. The thinner pots tend to be a little more delicate. Okay. My ceramics instructor in college said you should be able to get your shape in three passes. I can almost do that. I'm going to make one more pass. Just to thin out the bottom a little bit. And create some height here. All right. You'll note that it's not shaped like the pipkin yet because I need to collar it in. So I'm going to get the outside wet and I'm going to use both hands and kind of collar the whole thing in to start with, but mostly here at the neck. See that? Pull this in to give it a little stability. I want to collar that neck in some more. I want to keep this round. 
Need a little more speed. Pull that collar in. And I always remove my hands very gently. Okay. Neck is fine. This is still a little too wide, so I'm going to kind of push it in, which actually pushes it up a little bit. And that's okay. I like that. That's good. This, the, the act of collaring in thickened it a little bit, so I'm going to check and see if it's too thick. If I need to pull it up a little bit more. It seems to be fine though. It didn't, I didn't collar it in that much. All right, so now it's generally the shape I want. Now I need to trim the top edge off because the top edge is a little uneven. It always is. You can't help having it that way. If I leave the top edge uneven, when I turn it over to, um, to trim it when it's dry, it'll be very difficult because I will never be able to get centered because the bottom, the, the top edge is uneven and so it'll be sitting on an uneven, uneven edge. So I've got a needle tool, stick with a needle on the top. I'm going to put my hands, this is still really wet. I'm going to stick the needle through the rim so that it evens it up. And there, it's clay I'll reuse. All right, so that's done. We had, yes. we had, a, we had a question. Um, mm -hmm. Historically, how big were the pipkins, or did they, did sizes vary? Big enough this, to get your hand in to clean it? Uh, you could, these pipkins, you probably could get a little hand in it or a brush. Depends on, but it, it could be anything, um, any size. Uh, when I go over to start trimming my other pipkins that I did lot yesterday, I will show you the various sizes that I have ready and the various styles, because this one is going to have a spout. You can have them without spouts. Um, but yeah, you, they can be pretty big with wide mouths that you can get your whole hand into, or they can be really tiny that you would want to use a bottle brush to clean it. Um, there's really no limit. And I, I've also, one of my favorite pictures from the uh, manuscript, the Romance of Alexander has a woman heating up something in a port, in a pipkin on a portable fire. The pipkin is a very tall, skinny pipkin with a long straight handle and long legs. So there's all kinds. The, the, the real thing is it's got three legs and it's not terribly large. It gets too large, then it's really a cauldron. And I'm actually going to work on something big enough that to be calling a cauldron here before long. So now I am uh, I'm smoothing this, this edge. It's more power, so it's rounded. I don't like rough edges. So, and rough edges, the glazes tend to break there and you, you, it's easier to chip something when you have a square rough edge or a sharp edge than it does when you have a round edge. So round your edges. All right, so this is actually pretty much done. It's round and it's pulled in and it's got a lip. And I will be able, when I trim it, I'll be taking off a lot of that bottom to make it rounded. So right now I'm going to take my wood knife and I'm going to slide it underneath and then I'm going to take it and go in as an angle to create a channel that I can use my uh, wire tool to cut it off the wheel head. Again, as the, as the wheel slows down, I got to go slower around regardless. And that's where I get all my left leavings, all the bits and pieces, all the stuff that comes off when I trim, I reuse it. And I have years and years worth because I didn't have a pug mill until a couple of years ago. All right, I don't have a wire tool over here, so excuse me for a second. I walk right over here and grab one of the half dozen wire tools that I have. All right, wire tool just like we use to cut off the clay. But now I, I do want to slow it down and run the wire tool underneath it. Okay, now it's it's been cut off. Now I want to create the spout before I remove it. So I just put my fingers on either side of where I want the spout and then I use this finger to create just a little tiny spout. It's not going to be a deep throat spout. It's just a little there's a deep throat spout. You see that? I just want a little bitty 
dip in the lip to make it easier to uh, throw things, I mean, to pour things. That's as much as I need right there. Just a little bitty, bitty spout. Okay, so that is ready for me to remove from the wheel head. And I like to put it on a board or something so I can carry it around. Here's a board. Right there. So I can just pick it up with my fingers like that because I cut it off the wheel head. It's not too big for me to be able to do that. Try not to touch the sides so I don't dent it or make it uneven. So I'll stick it over here on my board so I can carry it around easily. All right. Let's do one more before, well, let's do all three before I go over and do the next step, which is trimming. Okay. I can dry that off again. Okay. All right, here's a bigger piece of clay. Some of those folds, ridges, and stop the wheel head, smack it on the center, and then smack it down. Okay. All right. Get this thing going as fast as I can. My water's, my sponge. Pushing the clay to the center, which is why it's called centering. I was saying that this wheel is faster than I went outside, but since I turned my wheel outside into having a concrete flywheel, and I'm doing this, I'm thinking it's about the same speed now because I'm feeling the same things. I take that little bit of play off the bottom where it touches the wheel head to give me a place to put my hand because I want to start by putting right against the, uh, the bat and move up. <laughs> Okay, I took my hand off wrong, so it kind of shifted it. You to take your hand off slowly. Okay, there we go. So let's open it up. This one's a deeper one, so it's gonna be a bigger pipkin you will be able to get your hand in this one to clean it. Clean out a little bit. Okay, and take it down a little bit deeper, just a little bit, not too much. You can always remove it with trimming, but it's really hard to put it back. Okay, so now I'm gonna start pulling up. Starting at the bottom, pressing. I'm rounding it as I go up to create that pipkin shape, but I'm trying to pull it back in at the top so I don't have to collar in as much. And the water out of the bottom. 
All right, one more, one more pass. Yeah, that's gonna be the last pass. This is it enough? And Okay. You can press the bottom, make it more rounded, more shapely, the way that I want it. All right, now I'm going to do the collaring again. But my bottom is kind of, kind of got a little big, so I'm going to start at the bottom and kind of compress it. It's more speed. Move up and start collaring it in. supporting it every way that I can to keep it from flopping. All right, so that's colored in enough. Like I said, this is gonna be a much bigger pipkin. I'm, this has gotten thicker, so I'm thinning out the side a bit and also creating my flare. Do you see how uneven that top is now? It's a bigger piece, so it's much more distinct. So I need to get my <coughs> needle tool, fingers on either side. Pretty uneven. In fact, I'm going to need to do it again. There we go. That's much better. <coughs> okay, I'm going to round my rim. Make sure I got the flare like I want it. I need to work on my bottom here it's not quite as round so I'm just kind of shaping it a little bit I'm not going to stick my hand in there again and maybe I'm not going to stick my hand in there again I'm just kind of steadying it creating the shape I want okay all right Good enough, I don't want to screw it up. All right, so let's uh, cut it off the bottom. It's real easy to just keep fiddling with it and fiddling it with it. I lost so many pieces in college because I was too much of a perfectionist and it just never was good enough. So I didn't even have hardly anything my very first semester because I just couldn't leave the stuff alone. All right, use my wire tool, slow it down a bit. Cut off bottom. And now create my spout like I did before. Just a little spout, right? Lift it up and the way you do it is you put the fingers like that and then you twist the wheel a little bit to snap it off the wheel head. So that's number two. Let me show you the difference in sizes of the two. So it's basically twice as big. You're really, it's a huge hole. All right, one last one. Little bitty thing of clay. Let's get this cleared off. There's a lot of waste. You gotta cut off bits and trim bits off. Even the, the liquid I use, I don't throw out, it stays in a bucket. I use it to, uh, when I pug, as the moisture, because I have a lot of dry clay that I use and wet clay, and then bags of dry clay that I get from Seattle pot Pottery to create my, uh, my clay in the pug mill. All right, last one, just a tiny one. It'll be very small. Whoops, that slid a lot. Hopefully it'll stay down. Seems to be okay. All right. My sponge. Uh, keep trying to press the go pedal. I don't, go pedal's not on because I'm doing it medievally.
And the wheel is starting to get slick because I don't have that splash guard on it. There we go. That'll work. All right. Open it up. A little bit more. Okay. Now let's start pulling it up. So somebody just asked something that I was thinking about too. So she said, it's just like magic watching the pots form. How do you get all the clay that splatters off your clothes? <laughs> laundry. You stick it in the laundry. You, know, you might dust it off, but I don't have the splash guard on, so I'm getting wetter than I normally do, but it's just liquid. And I just stick it in the laundry. I generally don't wash it with other things. I'll wash it with my gardening clothes, but um, you just... Stick it in the laundry. At events, uh, hang the, uh, I might rinse out the aprons and hang them out on the tent lines to dry. But uh, it, I've known to go to court covered in clay. I mean, there's no getting it out. Not at events, but you just stick it in the laundry when you get home. Okay, now I'm gonna push it out. It's just dirt. Pull that in a little bit because that's one more flat on me. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to collar it in. Yeah, real wet. Pull this up because it needs to be thinned out a little bit. And take that edge off because it's a little wonky. And round and smooth the rim. Just squeezing it together and pinching it together and then just rounding it. Pulling out the flange. Yeah, it's okay. It's not quite the shape, but it works. I guess it is really the shape. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put my spout in. There you go. Put it off the wheel head. Yeah, it doesn't matter when you put the spout in. It's just it's not a it's not a hard thing to do. I can do it before or after I cut it off the wheel head. As long as it's steady. All right, wire tool. Oh, straighten up that spout a little bit. Looked kind of strange there. Don't want to touch it too much because it'll misshape it. All right, then I get up off the wheel head. Put it over there. Now, I can't trim those tonight because they're way too wet. I will have to trim those tomorrow. So tonight I'm going to clean off this wheel head and we're going to trim some that I threw last night. They're still a little damp. They'll work. All right. Tie up the wheel. 
and I'm going to go down to the ground and get some of this moisture off the floor because it is really wet. I should have thought about putting that splash guard on before. This dries up pretty good because it is a um, big slab of uh, metal, not a piece of wood like my other one is on the top. The thing is, you know, you got to be able to grab it and push. Okay, so I'm going over here and I'm going to do this. There you go. So these are the pieces that I threw last night. All about the same shape. So those are the ones I'm going to trim. And these are the other things I threw the night before. So there's a pitcher. And there is what's going to be a cauldron. And that one, yes, indeed, is another pipkin. So I'm going to move these. They're still a little damp over here. I'm going to put you back where you need to go. There we go. Back over here. Let me get the other two. Three. I don't know how many of these I'm going to trim because the one I just picked up is really damp. Somebody just asked, um, you don't, you do not spend lots of time making uh, the finished shape super smooth. Is there a rhyme or reason for that? Uh, well, a couple of reasons for a pipkin. They weren't super smooth because they were objects that you used in the medieval kitchen and it didn't really matter what they look like. Um, if I was going to be doing something that needed to have a very smooth surface, I would take more time and do it, but I don't with a pipkin. Besides that, when I trim it, the bottoms are going to get smoother because I'm going to trim clay off. Plus, I have handles to put on, so they'll be, you'll get a little messy with putting the handles on. But it just depends on what the object is, but mainly pipkin, I'm no, I don't spend a lot of time trying to make it perfect because it wasn't. It was not perfect. Um, if you looked at some of the, I have some extant pieces of bits and pieces of pottery, and they are really rough. Pottery in the, in the time period I'm working with, 11th, 12th, 13th, was not meant for the high table. You didn't see that until you got into the Renaissance time when you saw a lot of maiolica that was very nicely done. That was when you had more of a a burgeoning middle class and they wanted nice things and clay was cheaper than the metal. So you did see many beautiful things done out of clay, real artwork that was used at the head table or at the sideboard of a fine, of a fine house. But these are not, they're for cooking and they'll break. So don't spend too much time on it. Okay, so let me see, which one is the driest? That's good enough. See, this is called leather hard. It resembles leather. It feels like leather. It's not too terribly wet, but it's not bone dry. So I can, when I, when I trim it off, it comes off in streams instead of powder. You don't want it to be to powder when you're trying to trim it. So I feel it and look at it, figure out how much I need to take off of it. No, well, I'm going to turn it upside down. And now I got to get a couple pieces of clay because I'm not going to do it the easy way. I'm going to do it the old fashioned way. So I need a little bit of clay to use to hold it down once I get it centered. So I got to center it again. So I try to put it in what I think is center. And then I take my needle tool, use as a marking tool, spin it around, and then I use this to see, wow, how did I manage that? That's right in the center. Because I, as I'm making the mark around there, the, I'm not getting any, any spots where the needle's not making the mark. That's pretty good. Got it right in the center. So I take my little bits of clay and divide it into four pieces. And I'm going to put it down on the wheel head and a little bit on the pot itself, opposite each other on two sides, and then opposite each other on the other two sides, just to hold this down so it doesn't move when I start kicking it around. All right, so now I need to get a bladed tool. This is pretty soft, so I'm gonna actually use a wire tool. 
That's my wire tool. Let's see if you can see it. It's just a wire on a stick. All right, so I'm going to remove the clay that doesn't belong. Keeping in mind that at this very center, it's thinner than any place else, and I don't want to go too deep, so I don't want to break through onto the other side. I'll just run it across the top to start with. And see, it comes off in strips. I'm going to go down the side. And I'm rounding it. I'm not creating a base because I'm going to create the base with feet. Take a lot off the side here because I'm rounding it. You know, Pipkins in particular, you've taken off a lot of clay. So yeah, here's another reason why bother making it really, really pretty when you're about to remove half the clay off the bottom. I've got amount as much as I'm gonna take off. I just need, I'm just smoothing it now. Clay wants to stay because it's a little damper than I like to trim with. It wants to stick back to itself. And make it nice and round, evenly round. Okay, let's see this. These things that was cling on it to get off. Okay, now we got almost everything off. And it's round enough. So I'm just Rubbing my fingers on it to catch any sharp edges, smooth it down some more. If throwing rings appear again, that's fine. I like throwing rings. I like the way the throwing rings work. Look, makes you realize it is indeed something that was thrown on a wheel head versus hand built. Okay, let's see what it looks like now on the inside. Play up there because I'll reuse it for the next pot. Oh, that feels good. Yeah, that's good. Nice round pot. So to store it, I have to turn it upside down and I'll put it back over here and grab the next one. That looks pretty good. Okay, here's one. Let's see if I can do as well with that one. Because sometimes when you put a spout in, it makes your rim uneven. These have a very small spout, so the rim didn't shift, so it's still easy to center it. If you put a pretty significant spout, it could warp the rim and makes it a little bit harder to get it centered. You can still do it, it's just not as easy. See, that one's not perfectly centered, you can tell. So I'm holding up the needle tool steady. And I know it's hard to see, but you can see the scratch of the needle tool all the way around that you don't have it. That means this was farther that direction. So I go around to where the, where the scratches of the needle tool are there, just get ice and centered, and I push it the opposite direction just a little bit. And I'm gonna erase my scratches so I don't get confused and try again. Okay. So I still have a problem, but it's a little bit further along. So I'll do it again. Just a tige. Erase my marks. And then do it again. Really close now. Just a tiny bit. Tiny bit that direction. 
This is why I like my gif and grip. My grip and gif do it all automatically with a twist. And if I do too much, I can. This is really close. I could push it out of center if I do it too much. But that looks pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So, we got a little piece of clay again, divided into four pieces. Stop right there. I'm holding this down so it doesn't shift while I'm pushing it on either side. A drier piece of pottery would shift much easier than this kind of damp piece. It's almost adhered itself to the wheel head because it's still a little damp on the rim, but not quite. Not enough for me to trust it. All right, there we go. Get it spinning. Again, I'm using my loop tool versus a bladed tool. This I would use for something drier, and this one I would use for something bigger. This is plenty big enough for this size of object. Uh, trying to see you can see it. All right, begin at the bottom. Start with and down the side, rounding it as I go. You see the strips of clay want to stay. They don't want to necessarily come off. So I have to kind of brush them off or pull them off when they're at this moisture level. Get out there. I'm getting a little thin, so I'm, I'm just going to now clean it up. Get any obvious wonkiness out of it. And keep it nice, smooth, even consistency. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, picking up the loose bits. Now I'm going to use my fingers, just smooth it, take off any rough edges. Okay, good enough. Clear out some of this strips, trims. My anchor clay off. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Not too thin, pretty good. So let's put that one over here, upside down. Oops, 
And be careful not to gouge the piece you already have there. Watch those fingernails. You notice, no fingernails. Very short fingernails. Might as well, if I'm gonna do clay, might as well forget having fingernails. It, it doesn't work. Throwing with fingernails puts scourges in your clay. So I trim my nails two or three times a week. You can tell when I haven't been doing clay because the nails start to grow. They grow more than now than they ever did when I was in high school when I wanted long nails. Now that I don't want them, I can't seem to keep them off. Fixing up my spout. It had an issue. It didn't look pretty. Now I'm making it pretty. There we go. Okay. Once more with feeling. The needle tool. We have this really off center. There are some people who can just tap them to center. I really admire that people can do that. I can't. They just, if I start tapping them, they just flies off the wheel. That's really, really close. It's so close that I'm going to call it good. All right. Anchors. I'm mostly pushing on the on the wheel head, not the pot when I put these on. Just gently push it on the pot because I don't want to again misshape the pot rim. All right. Sometimes it's hard to center a pot because the pot itself is not centered. It may have some imperfections in it. You have to work around it. I should have probably thrown these earlier in the day. I didn't throw these till like 10 o'clock last night because I went, oh, I should have some pots to trim tomorrow. And finally got around to doing it. That's why they're a little, a little soft. They're workable, definitely workable. Uh, somebody asked, is there a difference in the type of clay used for cooking pots than for other pots that are never heated? Well, there should be. In this case, they're not because I'm using the same stuff I use for any, anything else. But clay that has more porosity is better for cooking because it gives room for the clay to expand and contract when it gets hot. The way you do that is you add stuff to the clay when you're making it. More sand, more vermiculite, more something in it that's going to take space and then when and then when it like in the case of vermiculite when you fire it it burns away and you have little itty bitty microscopic spaces in between the clay particles that give you room to, for it to expand and contract so yes you should do i not all the time but i also and and yes i do have pieces when i put them on the fire they do break but there's always a reason uneven heating um, removing them from the fire to a cold surface too quickly. Um, anything that will cause a thermal shock will uh, cause the clay to cause a cause piece to break. So my pieces I'm very careful with when I cook in them. I, and next year, hopefully, if we are able to do amber, embers and ambrosia, my pots, I'll have a lot of pots ready by then, um, will be used for the cooking demo that we have there. And I think I'm gonna bring my pottery demo there too. I tried to do it this year, of course, but it was canceled for a very good reason. But I would highly suggest going to Embers next year if you can, because you'll see this stuff in action. And there's nothing more fun than watching the cooking in these actual pots. It's so exciting. A lot of people are afraid when they buy my stuff, they're afraid to use it for cooking because it will break. But then you run that risk with anything you use over a fire. I do make bakeware 
I use the same clay for bakeware. And uh, I have my friend Ellen who uses it, my stuff all the time for her baking. You just have to be in, in her oven, in her electric oven. Uh, just have to be careful. You don't, you don't put it in a preheated oven. You put it in a cold oven and then you turn the oven on. When you, move, when you remove it from the oven, you put it on like a rag or something that's not a cold surface, not like a piece of wood. A piece of wood is colder than a rag. You just, you, or on the stove top where it's still hot until it cools down. Well, it's still warm, not hot. You just let it, let it cool down carefully, let it heat up carefully. The same thing with anything, you just have to, to watch it. And also lids are a little difficult. I need wooden lids because when I, whenever inevitably when I have I don't have a, I don't have any clay lids. I just I just don't throw them that often. Inevitably when I use a plate, a ceramic plate as a lid, if it goes over the edge of the pot, it'll break around that ring because the ring that goes over the edge when it's cooking is a different temperature than what is actually over the pot. So a wooden lid works better. Just a wooden disc. One of these days, I'm going to get some. Maybe by next Embers and Ambrosia, I'll have some wooden lids. Now, if you have a lid that fit perfectly on the pot, it probably would work. Morgana does lids for her pipkins all the time. I'm basically lazy. I don't like to. Okay, that one's pretty good too. Not too thin. Got a good heft to it. Turn that upside down over here. I've got one left, and then we move on to handles. Actually, I think we're not even going to do this one because this, it is really damp. So that one will just sit there, and later in the evening, I'll come back and trim it. We're going to move to handles now. I'm going to move away from this area. I'm going to take my sample over here, and I'm going to move the three pots. You can see my giant hand. The three pots that we just did over here. And move you over here so that you can see what I'm doing at my other workstation. Mm -hmm. Let's see, this is better over here, maybe. See, my fancy camera stand is one of my little jars with a rag in it to keep it steady. Seems to work. Okay, so we have to. Uh, Gene is saying, my pipkin is designed with a later time period. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm making a handle and three little feet. And these little feet have little toes because I think they're cute. They're short little feet and have little toes. You don't have to do it that way. Let me, let me show you some other pipkins that I've done recently. Reach over your head. Here's one with straight legs. Very, very traditional. But it's just straight legs. It's still a spouted pipkin. It doesn't have as deep a throat. It has a little handle. All right. So let me reach over here further in. And here is a two-handled pipkin with the little toes on the feet. Just another type. Okay. Here's another one. Spouted pipkin with toes. I like the toes. Okay. I, li I like the toes. And spouted handle. Okay, I don't think I have any big pipkins up there. No, nothing big. This one right here, when I trim it, will be a nice big cauldron. It'll have two handles on it and, and the three feet. Not very long feet, very short. All right, so start with, I have a piece of clay. I need, to get a lug of clay to pull handles. That looks big enough to do a few handles. All right, so I'm gonna wedge it like I do everything else, get it all, the platelets go in the right direction. It's all work together. And then I'm gonna make a little noise here. I am compressing and elongating the piece of clay so that I can pull it. 
some people are really good and they can put the luck on the pot and pull the handle from the pot. I don't do that. I'm going to try at some point, but I'm not going to try on, on a class day. Okay, that's pretty elongated. That's even more elongated. All right, so now I need a pot of water. Because the way that you pull handles is with a lot of water. So that is my bucket of slip of liquid leavings from my drawing that I use. I'm going to move these out of the way so I don't get water all over. I'm going to move them over here to my trimming station because I'm going to get a little splashy. All right. So here's my lug of clay. Hold it firmly at one end. Wet the clay and my hand, and I leave it over the pot because I'm gonna get this thing wet. And you're just pulling. You're using this, this round part of your finger and your thumb to pull. Now that's not round. So you alternate the side that you're pulling on. Get you a little closer. And you just pull it out. Now you can put, make, handles and feet using the extruder. I have an extruder. One of these days I'm actually going to use it. And you can also do it by rolling out coils and doing it that way or rolling out a slab and cutting slab ones. I, I like the handle to pull because it does, again, compress the clay, make it stronger, get everything all lined up. Um, and, you know, using the extruder is a big messy process. So this, this really doesn't take me long. Okay, so what I have right now is a good thickness for feet. See, that's a good thickness for feet. I'm gonna just even off the top here so I have kind of a long, this bottom gets uneven, a little thicker. Okay, so that, a good thickness for feet. So I'm going to set that aside over here, pinch it off. Then with this, what's left here, I'm going to try to make some thinner handles. May not be enough for me to really get much out. I'm going to have to get another piece of clay. All right. I don't need the handles. Real thick. I don't want them. Whoops. I don't want them too thin either. I'm just eyeballing it. That looks pretty good right there. That's a good thickness for handles. Put that over there. Pinch it off. This is too small for me to throw handle or pull handles with. So I'm gonna have to get another piece of clay. Get another wire tool. Cut off some more. I don't want it too big because I want to be able to actually get a good handle on it. Good hand on it to pull. Use a lot of towels in here. My surface is wet. This surface is a board that's been inset into a frame that is and the board is covered with canvas it's my actually made by my friend michael kaplan it's a portable wedging table that i use when i do demos but it works really nicely here as a side workstation for my wheels so i just kept it here and besides that i don't do demos but two or three times a year so I might as well use the furniture that was made for my potter booth. Okay. 
mais feitiço. I'm gonna do another, so I need nine legs, three for each pot. So I'm gonna do another one that's thick enough for legs. I don't have to make them round. I could make them flat too. I do a lot of handles flat. Okay, that's a good enough thickness for legs. So I'll put that over there, pinch it off. Now I'm gonna make some more handles thinner. I used to hate putting handles and legs on things because it took so long, but I like it now. And I also have decided that I need to not do so much pottery at one time that I'm having to do a lot of finishing work all at once. Do a few pieces in the evening. The next night you only have a few pieces to finish. Okay, that's a good size handle. Finish that off. All right, I'm gonna see if that's enough. Handles. I have my work surface. Okay, so I have a pipkin, I have feet, and I have handles. There. I need a knife. This is a metal knife. I need something to create. Um, Scores where I put it together, which means a sharp, pointy thing. And I need my thick slurry. Really thick. This has been brewing for days. The leavings in my in my throwing tray. Just nice and thick. And as it sits here, if it gets too thick, I add a little little water to it and stir it up. But it's really, really thick. So the point of the slurry is you need to create a, a weld for the legs or the handles to the pot. They're two different moisture contents, so you want to make that moisture content closer. And that's what the slurry does. That's what you do when you're doing slip and score. That's what it is. You're scoring first and then you're slipping, but you know, slip and score. All right, so I'm gonna put legs on this pot. The, re the position I like to put the legs on, on a pot, is for the spout, I like to have two legs in front. So, you know, when you tip it to pour it, you're tipping it on two legs, and one leg in the back. So, put it down, and I have a mark where I'm going to put my legs. And somewhere over here, uh, there it is, I have a tripod piece of kiln furniture. This is something that you put a pot on that you have glazed all the way around so that it doesn't stick to the kiln shelf and you end up with three little tiny marks where it's sitting on the and it's supposed to just pop right off unless the glaze runs all over it. Well this you see is a perfect thing to mark where the legs go on a tripod pipkin because it's a tripod. It doesn't matter if it's too big or too small it's just giving me a general idea where to put it. So I got my spout facing forward. I'm putting my two legs in front and I put it right on the center. Just push it a little bit. And it's kind of hard to see, but you see, you got, I got three dots. That's where the general area I'm going to put my uh, legs. So I'm going to now score those general area spots, straightening it up where it needs to go. It's really moist clay, so it's going to stick real good. Generally what I think the size of my legs are gonna be. Scored. All right, so now I'm gonna cut my um, legs. Just little short legs, I don't need long legs. See, these legs were very short. With little feet, I'm gonna put little feet on them. I'll cut the end off. Side, gonna look well like that, it's good. That's how long I'm gonna make them. At least this first part. There's three. I'm gonna go ahead and cut 
others while I'm at it. That over there. So now I have something to go by. The next one. All right. So now I'm going to apply the legs. I put some of my slurry. Put some of my slurry on the three spots. Trying to mix it up, put some more scores in there. It's really moist now. Okay, and so we've slurried. Now I'm going to take a leg and I'm going to kind of angle it a little bit. Just I'm just kind of making it at an angle because the pot's at you know, like at an angle. So I'm going to stick my hand in the pot to kind of anchor it. Just push that leg on there. Then I'm going to do the other two. Same kind of way. Um, just that, so it's kind of at an angle, only kind of, not really permanent angle, hard angle, just a little angle. Shove it on there. Okay, they're on there. But you know, they're really only attached on one side. They're not attached on the inside, they're just sitting there. And it's kind of hard for me to pull that clay down. So I use a little bit of extra clay, roll up a little bit of a coil. The same clay that I was using for the legs, still very, very soft, malleable clay. And I'm putting it on the inside. Morgana, at some point you need to let me know how you do legs like this. This is just the way I've always done it to make sure that they stay because I can't ever just do it without doing it and have them stay without popping off. I'm also putting a little pressure on there. All right, now I need little bitty wood tool. So my favorites is, you know, I've got a smooth curved edge on one side and a pointy end. I'm going to smooth this stuff. So on the inside, I'm just pulling up that bit of clay onto the leg. And then I'm going to push it down onto the pot to attach it, doing both. and smoothing it the other side. Remember what I said about being messy? This is messy. I'll smooth it off a little bit, but it's never gonna be perfect. There we go. Do it the other, other two now. Excuse me. There we go. <clears throat> and one more. Yeah, I'm doing a little smoothing and removing of any <coughs> excess clay. There we go. All right, so if I turn this over, Amazing as it seems, it will support itself, even though it's really soft clay. But you will notice it's not very even because even though I uh, put them on the same length and generally the same spots, I'm stretched out a bit or something. So I'm using my, my uh, little wheel here 
take a look at it and say, yeah, it's a little uneven and that back leg is the one that's the culprit. So use my knife and cut a little, little bit of the back leg. And also, these are really long legs. That's a little bit better. Back leg is still a little long. Get these straight and then I can put the feet on it. Okay, so that was too much in the back. <laughs> Get a little bit off the front. Yeah, a little bit off the front. <laughs> That's good enough. All right, but you will see that that is considerably longer, although this pot is about the same size, it's considerably longer than the legs that I'm aiming for. So I'm gonna be cutting a little more off because even when I pulled up the feet, it's, they're still gonna be really long. So. Obviously, my legs are too long for my, the other pot, so um, the next ones I'll make shorter. I'm just eyeing it. Okay. Put it in the center. Make it a little bit easier to tell. It's even, it's even enough. All right, so now I got these cute little legs and I wanna make toes on them. So I'm gonna first kind of flatten them out and smooth that edge, each one of them, elongated, facing the outside. Then I'm going to cool them out a little bit and flatten. See? Yep, the feet are created. Put back on the wheel head, I mean the turntable. Make sure I'm okay. Prop you up a little bit. It looks okay. Now I'm going to make the little toes. And the way I make the little toes, I'm putting right here on there, and two fingers, and I'm going to push up on either side, create three little toes, or at least three little things that kind of remind you of toes. That's just my signature uh, style of leg for my little pipkins, for the most part. The straight legs are probably more period. Although, although, you see, I got them from this picture. You see, it kind of looks like they're little toes, kind of. So, you got documentation. All right. So now it's time to put a handle on it. There, so it doesn't go spin around and around and around. So, I'm going to take one of the thinner, long strips that I used, that I pulled for um, using for a handle, and cut generally what size handle I want. That looks pretty good. It may be too long, but it might not be. Let's see. All right, slip and score again. Go directly opposite the spout at the rim for one side of the handle. Like that. And then on the shoulder is where I'm going to put, or maybe a little bit below the shoulder of the pot, is where I put the other one. Like that. Slip. Yeah, more scoring. And take my handle. Just kind of flattening one side slightly, just slightly, 
because that one is going to go up under here at the rim and I'm going to push it in. And then it's going to bend around and I'm going to push the other end right there. And then I'm going to smooth it on this side. Where's that? My smooth wood tool to get in there where my fingers can't reach. To smooth that down, remove excess clay. See, the top is nice and smooth on the bottom. I could have made this handle a little bit longer because it just touches the pot when I really need to kind of give it a little more to hook onto the pot. So I'm gonna to have to do my little trick of putting a little roll of clay on the inside of this handle. I'll get it wet with my slip, put it in there just to give it a little more strength. make a good connection. You see how the reason I get so dirty is I use my dress as a rag too. There we go. Load it up on the handle, down on the pot. Smooth it with my fingers. Okay. All right, tripod pipkin. If I wanted to, I could make decorations on it, like it was done in period, which is a big circular. Um, designs in a different color clay. I've add some red iron oxide. Since this is a light color, I've added a little red iron oxide to the slip and paint on there. i just leave it like it is. Um, in period, they weren't necessarily glazed and most of the time not glazed on the inside. You can find out what people were cooking by analyzing the insides of pots because they weren't sealed. The, the, whatever you were cooking was absorbed into even the vitrified clay, which is why you don't cook medicine in the same pot that you cook food in, because you, you've, the pot has, has been seasoned with whatever you're cooking in it. Um, for modern purposes, I glaze the inside for ease of cleaning. Uh, I may just have the glaze on the outside drip down. I don't necessarily glaze the outside because I want to be, it to be able to expand and contract um when it goes over fire besides that it's more period aesthetic may not be beautiful it's not supposed to be beautiful it's supposed to be useful but uh that's the way that i do that that's what was was done with this this pot is glazed very lightly on the inside and then i dipped it in the glaze so that it covered the handle so that when you hold the handle it's smooth and then just let what leftover glaze run down the side of the pot. The um, pattern on it was painted on with a white slip on top of the red clay. So there's a tripod pipkin. Um, pretty much that's it. Um, I have some others that I'm going to be putting the feet and the handles on. There's others that I'm going to be trimming tonight, but that's it for the class. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything like that? While we wait to see if people have questions, I just want to say, I do think that that's beautiful. So, I mean, you know, like, but, um, but you would because it's your time period. <laughs> yeah, true. Very true. It's my aesthetic. That's true. Yeah. I love Pipkins. Well, I love, love Pipkins so much. Um, it was the, it was the, the form that really, really cemented my, my place in the SCA. And I discovered that, that illustration in the Romance of Alexander that had the picture of the woman uh, heating up food in a, in a cooking pot. And I don't think I have that picture with me. 
I do. What do you know? In this documentation packet I put together for this, I put pictures of, of many different pipkins. So here is a copy, black and white copy, of the picture from the Romance of Alexander, which is in the Baudelaire Library in, in, uh, in England. Uh, you see the woman down here is heating up something you know, over a portable fire in a three-legged cooking pot with a long handle. And I have recreated that particular pot before, but this was my inspiration. I found this drawing in a, in a clothing book, um, cl uh, costume through the, through history, throughout history or something. This particular drawing, this particular illustration was listed in there, which is how I found it. Also, thanks to Mark de Gockler from many years ago, he brought some pipkins with him to one a &S event and he let me take pictures of them. So there is some real actual period pipkins all in one piece that I've kept the pictures for. These are like 15th century Dutch pipkins, 1400s, much later than what I'm doing here. Well, not much later, only a hundred years later. Um, that's all the pictures of extant pipkins that I have. But I was just delighted to find that one picture. So, was that um, yeah. when you when you cook with a pipkin, is the heat centered under the belly, or is the pipkin set to the side of the coals and turned? Yeah. When I put this on a brazier, I put it at the edge of the coals to get it heated up first. You always put liquid in it, whatever liquid, some liquid in it, when you put it on the brazier, and then you slowly introduce the coals around it, and at some point, it'll have coals all around it and under it. So it's heating from all over the bottom and goes up. Um, with, as it's like with any other cooking pot. The, the difference with the pipkin is you can actually scoot some coals underneath it. Whereas with a regular cooking pot, it just sits flat on the brazier and you're putting the coals around it. So is that really the kind of the purpose of the feet is to be able to put some underneath? The purpose of the feet, I think, is to keep it steady in the fire. I mean, you can, you can use this under in a fireplace, in a kitchen fireplace, pretty easily, and it keeps it steady. Um, I find that being able to put coals underneath it makes it heat up a little faster, but not necessarily because the big cooking pots, you have those coals piled up, piled up around them. They're still going to get hot. Um, even the bottom is going to get hot. And really, if you want to see these in action, unfortunately, it'll be next year um, where we'll have cook, actual cooking demos at Embers Ambrosia. And I'll make sure we have some of these available to use for those people that are cooking. How long do, um, how long do, do these or, or any of kind of the, the stuff that you use over the fire, how long do those tend to, to uh, last for you? I've had some pots that have last years and years and years. I've had pots that cracked and I still continue to use them for years and years and years. Um, every now and then I get one that just breaks beyond, beyond use. But uh, a good many of them will last a long time if you're careful, if you remove them from the fire carefully, if you put them on the fire carefully, if you don't use flame, if you use charcoal. Um, the modern ones that like Ellen uses for baking, she's had those, I haven't ever replaced them and she's had them for years at least seven or eight years. Uh, but she's very cautious with them and she loves the way they cook because nothing sticks, not even sticky stuff sticks to them. And they're not glazed. They're like you know, the Pampered Chef stuff, the unglazed pie pans. It really depends on how good you take care of them, I mean, as long as you're cautious. But you don't be surprised if they do break because it's, it's clay. So if you really don't want to cook with it because it's a piece that you bought and it was really expensive, don't cook with them. Uh, I don't worry about it because I can make more. I'm in a different situation. Do you need to season them like cast iron? No, mm -mm. no, they're, they're not. They season themselves if you don't glaze the inside. Remember, I'm glazing the inside, but if it's unglazed on the inside, if you're cooking with one of my pots and it's unglazed, it will season with whatever you're cooking in it. Like I said, don't cook something that is a medicinal in a pot and then use it for food because it will carry that ingredient with it that's been seasoned into the pot if it's unglazed. 
you just have to be sure when you're cooking with it to put a little liquid in it before you put it on the fire. You don't put an empty pot on the fire. Maybe it can be warm. I, I tend to put warm liquid in it. I don't put cold liquid in it. I'll let it have a little bit of room temperature or warm liquid. I think that's all the questions I'm seeing. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for pretending. This was a lot of fun. I always enjoy doing the demos. I find I'm really enjoying it, doing it on Facebook and things like the Zoom. And I continue to go live every now and then. So if you check out my Facebook, I'm, every few days I'm going live just doing pottery. <laughs>